Hello, I'm Paula Blair and this is Audio Visual Cultures, the podcast that looks at aspects of and issues around modes of sound and image-based cultural production. Huge thanks to our Patreon members and to everyone who's been listening and engaging on social media. At the end of the episode, I'll give details on how you can support the podcast and be part of the conversation. I'm thrilled to present in this edition artist Sally Madge, who not only kindly took the time to chat to me about her work, but also wrote a vivid and informative reflective essay on her practice and life as a practitioner. We begin with Sally's reading. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Thanks for asking me to talk about my practice. I've decided to write about my work rather than talk freely, as I tend to stray off the point too easily. Text I've come up with is still a bit of a meander through the history of my practice, but I hope it gives a picture of what I do, where it comes from and where it might be going. There's always a difficulty of talking without visual backup, so I hope I don't go on too long. I thought I'd start with a text I wrote about making collage, which seems an apt description or even a metaphor for my general working process, chance encounters. As I work in my studio, things get cleared aside, dropped, piled up, lost and forgotten, sometimes later to be rediscovered and reused. Spillages, stains, accidents occur, byproducts of purposeful action the mess left during the process of creating something of greater significance. There are, however, definite possibilities inherent in these abject remains. Out of the corner of my eye, I notice an interesting juxtaposition of line, stain and torn part image. And once these are conjoined, there's a suggestion of something other, something more. Edges become points of departure, the place where action happens. Boundaries are blurred and borders crossed. It's the point where I have to distill, refine and formalise all this wonderful, potent chaos, which is challenging. In a conversation with the artist collagist John Stezaka, the writer and curator David Lillington states that collage is a realm of play, a retreat to the maternal gaze and protected reverie and working within the limits of already available components can be related to the childlike and the collagist's attachment to lost innocence. This resonates for me with regard to my own practice. My constant quest is to find the key which turns that playfulness into something more formulated, whilst retaining the freedom and open-endedness of the process itself. In 2010, I made work in an artist friend's small domestic gallery. It was called Making a Mess and Clearing Up. Over seven hours I drew blindfolded on the pristine white walls, feeling my way around the room and mapping my journey through the space, making marks with crumbling charcoal. Following the drawing process, I removed the blindfold, washed down the walls, swept the floor and repainted the space. Throughout the performance, viewers watched through the windows or entered the space. And by the end of the day, no apparent trace of my presence was left. The space restored to its original state, with all the stages of mark-making sealed into the fabric of the building and preserved behind a screen of white. I'd like to think the minimal outcome privileged my expressive process by refusing a final fetishised art object. If I think what drives my practice and where my ideas come from, partly I think of a rather solitary childhood where my parents were largely absent and the age gap between me and my siblings was big enough for me often to feel like an only child. We moved a lot so it was hard to put down roots or make lasting friendships. But throughout my childhood we always lived in the country and often near the sea so I roamed freely in the wide open spaces and developed an intimate and enduring relationship with the surrounding landscape, building dens, weaving fantasies, climbing trees, wandering the shoreline, collecting and hoarding. I think that echoes of this rich childhood experience, along with the loss, 
and the longing to recapture it reverberate throughout my practice. I suppose most artists go back to their childhood as a source for their work. I enjoyed and was told I was good at art at school, so on leaving I followed a conventional art training which prompted my first encounters with city environments, an art foundation course in Oxford, a diploma in ceramics in London, then a BA and MA in fine art here in Newcastle. Having cut my urban teeth on Oxford with many adventures and mishaps, I moved on to London. It was the swinging 60s and a mind-blowing culture shock for a country girl. This is an excerpt from a text I wrote for an artist friend's book. It's September 1966, Shepherd's Bush, London, a fine day. I leave the flat in Sinclair Road, feeling good in my new Anello and David black Spanish shoes and Mary Quant miniskirt, red. I spent half this term's grant on them, so extra shifts at the Italian restaurant are needed to fill the financial void. Black and red, I feel good. I'm on my way to pick up Sebastian and Georgia, the artists Mark Boyle and Joan Hill's kids, Boyle family, famous for their earth studies and liquid light shows. I look after the kids on a regular basis. It's Ivor Davis who introduced me, a friend and key player in the Destruction in Art Symposium, Dias, Gustav Metzger's Assembly of International Artists and Activists, using destruction in rather than of art as a strategy to critique conventional aesthetic forms and to promote direct engagement in culture as a political force for change. I'd met Iva earlier in the year when I assisted with one of the auto-destructive events he staged in Edinburgh as part of Dias. Now, as I look back, the only memory I have of this is a faded newspaper article and photograph where, along with a friend, I assist Ivor with his protective headgear, an old fire guard, in preparation for his detonations. It's following this that he comes to stay in my flat in Shepherd's Bush and sets to work on developing a destructible pyrophonic organ for his next event. I'm not really aware of the nature of his research and the materials he's using, but one afternoon on returning from a visit to a friend, I find several fire engines outside the flat. On entering, I'm confronted by a damp and charred bedroom and several police who are in the process of confiscating Ivor's chemicals, some of which have unexpectedly ignited and caused the fire. When things have calmed down and I've had a chance to take stock of the extent of the damage, I discover on checking my wardrobe that a neat round hole has been blown through the toe of one of my precious Anello and David shoes. No one can quite work out how it happened, such a precise puncture, so strategically placed. A conundrum which has over the years been a subject of much conjecture on my part. At some level, this shoe and the process whereby it has reached its altered state stand as a metaphor and signifier of my lowly status as a foot soldier in the battle against the established order. Here's a war wound and a battle scar. And there were many more during my life as an art student in London. However, all this has added grist to the mill of my later practice. If there is rhyme or reason to the art I produce, it might be located within the ordinary, unregarded stuff of everyday life and the extraordinary possibilities which lie within and beyond its boundaries. Things I make often grow out of a particular personal memory, encounter, place or event from which I make connections with broader social and political issues and try to create visual narratives which explore the deeper and more complex aspects of everyday experience. There are many factors guiding my methods and output. Sometimes I use performance as a means to an art end. Other times installation services the idea, a film, photographs, text, a collection of objects or a combination of all these a sort of expanded collage, if you like, where scraps on the tabletop and the floor develop into an environmental bricolage. It often depends on the context and specificities of the site, whether it's a gallery, open landscape, 
a library or an empty office block. Also, it makes a difference to the work as to whether I've been commissioned or if I'm just putting it out there. In the main, I think it's fairly safe to say my formal and aesthetic concerns are broadly rooted in a consideration of place and time. When I look back, there are certain themes which run through and connect different projects. Drawing on a rich tradition of feminist practice, I often use domesticity as my modus operandi. In 2009, I was commissioned to make an interactive work for The Dream of Fluxus, an exhibition of Fluxus items from an extensive private collection shown at Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art in Newcastle. I chose to do a performance which I called Avant-Garde, spelt G-U-A-R-D, harking back to my exalted London connections and my subordinate role amongst the art cognoscenti. I borrowed a cleaner's trolley and worked my way around the gallery, dusting and sweeping and cleaning showcases, arranging dusters and cleaning materials carefully around the space and generally keeping an eye on the exhibits as well as inviting visitors to join me in my endeavours. My aim was to draw attention to some of the ironies thrown up by the official art world's recognition of Fluxus, its original manifestos aimed for a living art, an anti-art, valuing the creativity of ordinary everyday activities rather than unique artefacts made by special individuals. But here, these revolutionary efforts were fossilised in museum showcases. So I turned the gallery into a sort of theatre where I wove in various themes for my actions as a flux worker. The role of women, the institutional appropriation of countercultural artistic endeavours and the codes and conventions which dictate gallery behaviour. Continuing with the performative and the domestic, as part of a group exhibition, Returning to the Philosopher's Table at the Lyttonville Library in Newcastle in 2013, I collected a lot of dust. In an excerpt from my diary, I described my dust-gathering experience. Swept gallery walkway for an hour, sometimes on hands and knees, but mainly squatting so as not to get splinters. Wore face mask, apron and rubber gloves. Got very hot and dusty. Interesting to think I've actually ingested some of this ancient and erudite dust. It's become part of the fabric of my being, if only temporarily. It does, however, make me feel quite sick, and I can feel a headache coming on. As I sweep, I note the Greek mythology and the biblical sections are dustier than others. There's a damp stain on the floor near social sciences. Ethics gets a lot of sun and the large gaps in the floorboards along the Spanish, French and German literature sections. I'm developing quite an affection for dust balls, and also note there are some tiny book sheddings in my dustpan. Some dust, which comes from under a loose floorboard, probably dates back to the 1800s. Following this, I produce small packages of literary and philosophical dust as artists' multiples and sell them for one ninety nine a packet. Dust again. Landscapes, Galata International Performance Festival, Istanbul 2008, and Landscopes, 2015, Baltic 39, Newcastle. I used a sticky lint clothes roller to lift the dust and debris off multiple surfaces. People, animals, plants, furniture, buildings... Each encounter required an active engagement with the subject or object, a conversation, a manoeuvre. The most daunting encounter, a large feral dog sunning itself on an Istanbul street. I approached it with great caution and managed to stroke it with my lint roller without injury. I displayed the peel-off sheets with their intricate surface patterns as drawings, landscapes and portraits. I was intrigued by the way that marks emerged as traces of encounters. Time and place were registered when those vestiges of events were deposited on receptive surfaces, where every presence, in order to know itself as present, bore the trace of an absence which defined it. Shades of Freud's mystic writing pad. In a solo show at Customs House Gallery in South Shields in 2015, 
I constructed a metal dome reminiscent of a Mario Mertz igloo, though in place of stone, glass and neon, I used lint drawings as cladding for the structure. Children who visited the gallery used it as a den. There are other projects where identity politics have played a central role in the work, notably in the performance collaborations with my late friend and artist Carol Luby, jam making using bread as a sculptural medium and tool for getting our message across and revisiting Valerie Solanas's scum manifesto. But at this point, I'd like to follow the den trajectory, in my case, makeshift shelters. In 2012, as part of a group show, New Curators Northeast, organised by the London-based Departure Foundation, I created a studio-come-workspace out of found materials in a partially empty office block in an industrial park in Sunderland. In one sense, this was an architectural construction, a temporary dwelling space within a bleak, empty office space, with connotations of squatting, the type of ad hoc construction found in marginal urban spaces to accommodate the homeless and disenfranchised. In another sense, an installation referencing the formal elements of sculpture and on view as an artwork and participatory installation. And further, a performative piece where the work started and continued with the process of selection, collection, placement, arrangement, use and dialogue. An excerpt from my diary at the time. As I mapped the area, cruised the car parks, looked through skips and encountered passers-by, as well as building materials, I gather lots of anecdotal and photographic research. It's become a fascinating compulsion. I leave home every morning and arrive as if at the office. The room in which I'm building my studio structure is also filling with photographs, charts, maps, books, tea, coffee, mugs, kettle, radio, tools. It's gradually turning into a temporary office cubicle, a studio and a research base. I hear doors banging somewhere in the building and watch from the windows people leave work. It feels quite lonely. I had hoped to sleep here. There's a shower downstairs, but the organisers have been told they can't allow it. Another temporary but enduring structure which grew from playful and informal beginnings was a small stone and driftwood shelter I built on the north shore of the island of Lindisfarne off the Northumbrian coast. This anonymous construction lasted, with many adventures, from 2002 till 2016, when it was finally destroyed by fire. During its life, it played host to many individuals who discovered it whilst walking the island or through word of mouth, and who left their mark inside it in the form of written testimonies, drawings, paintings, objects gleaned from the beach, photographs and keepsakes. Birds nested in its roof and small rodents inhabited its interior, a shrew and a stoat amongst others. After some tussles with officialdom over its illicit construction, and lack of planning permission, I won through and gained the approval of the powers that be to retain it as an artwork. On the strength of an Arts Council grant, I was able to shift it into a different gear without compromising its ad hoc autonomous ethos. To that end, I sought out individuals who, over the years, had left their contact details in the shelter. Amongst others, a professional dry stone waller who helped rebuild the structure to render it more secure, a musician from the Scottish borders who played his pipes for an evening gathering where Polanski's cul-de-sac, which had been filmed on the island, was screened. Through contact with the local school, I discovered they'd used the shelter as a stimulus for creative writing, inviting children to visit a hermit who lived there, one of their teachers in Roll. Artist residences were organised, exhibitions mounted, a sound installation installed, a film made and shown at Berwick Film Festival, and an online museum produced. Too much else to mention here, but a truly special collaborative project where my main role shifted from caretaker to fundraiser and project manager. Continuing with the theme of fugitive architecture, this is a good point to mention a work I'd made a lot earlier, 
a gerbil's guide to the galaxy in 2005 at Wagwood, an artist-run space in central Newcastle, now sadly lost. For this show, I installed a live web feed of a gerbil in its cage, chewing away at the pages of an old book, a 1933 first edition of an illustrated reference book, a compendium of carefully compiled, alphabetically organised facts, where, to quote from the editor's introduction, the reader has a mine of information at his fingertips. Within the confines of its cage, the gerbil went about the business of mining the data for its own purposes. Over a period of several weeks, it edited the book, translating the carefully constructed text into an unruly mass of dislocated fragments, recycling it as material for building a warm and secure nest. The fate of the book dissolved the architecture of knowledge into that of action. Likewise, the physical object diminished in size as its shape mutated and disintegrated. The gerbil as architect worked to reconstruct its environment according to its own design. References to and uses of live and preserved animals is another thread running through my work. I'm a real collector and I have many stuffed animals. A performance entitled Bird in Hand at the Freud Museum in London in 2011, previously staged as part of a Fluxus event, Three Star à la carte, at Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art in 2009. Here, I sat quietly in the lobby of the museum, next to a table in which I'd placed a box containing a preserved bird and a pair of white cotton gloves with an accompanying sign requesting visitors to open the box and follow the instructions. Inside the box, the text read, Put on the gloves, carefully lift out the bird, examine it closely, consider its beauty, be sad at its demise, tell it a secret, return it to the box, take off the gloves, close the lid, your secret is safe. My aim was to engage with the context of the Freud Museum as a site of display, as well as its visitors, and referencing psychoanalytical notions of free association and confidential disclosure. The bird, a red shank, a shoreline wader found on the northeast coast and freeze-dried at a local museum in the exact state in which it was found, was transformed in this travelling performance by the weight of its secrets while I, as the attendant, remained vigilant. More recently, as part of a group show, Borderlands, at Gallery North, Northumbria University, I've made a work based on the story of a Syrian brown bear, the mascot of a World War II Polish military unit stationed after demobilisation in 1946 in the Scottish borders. I'd visited the defunct airfield and its abandoned and derelict buildings, seen the marks of the bear's claws etched into the trunk of a tree, read the book, seen old film footage, and listened to local stories. I wanted to create a memorial. The bear, Wojtek, was adopted as a cub in Persia in 1942 by the military unit, which then travelled through Iraq, Syria and Palestine to Egypt. Formally drafted with the rank of private, complete with paybook and serial number, so as to be allowed to ship with the soldiers to Italy, Wojtek is said to have carried artillery shells during the decisive Battle of Monte Cassino in 1944, before passage to the displacement camp in Scotland. The installation consisted of a small screen video monitor sitting precariously on what looked like a pile of rubble or perhaps a waymarker cairn, made of broken and partly dressed masonry. The monitor hosted a short film of a man in a bear suit, wandering around the derelict airfield. Carefully composed, lingering shots showed the ruins and the pantomime bear, peering into doorways and out of windows, stamping on rubbish and banging metal on wood. Engaged in apparently aimless, rather melancholy play, or perhaps some kind of hopeless quest, and hinting at a story which is not quite evident other than as an uncanny juxtaposition of incongruous elements. And I quote from the text accompanying the exhibition, 
The installation presents an alternative monument, or an unmonument, to Wojtek, a Syrian brown bear. Here, rather than the usual heroic effigy and snapshot biography, attention is drawn to the disjunctures, absurdities, and inconvenient disorder of history, which often involves the official or unofficial transgression of boundaries and rules. The physical traces left by unruly forces persist in the form of ruins, whose reality of mess, detritus, entropy and decay, but also vitality and potential, can, if not fetishized, aestheticized, or otherwise tidied up, resist simplistic understanding. Conventional public memorials are also problematized as they tend to freeze a range of conflicting and contradictory experience into an authoritative, solid, static structure, reinforcing the fiction of a single shared narrative we are all expected to subscribe to. An overall aim, therefore, is to complicate the uniformity and conformity of mediated, ritualized remembrance. Remembrance, memory, time, space, place. Thinking about it, I think this is possibly a self-portrait. And that's where I'm finishing, mm -hmm. although there's lots more work to talk about. Do you feel that anything that you're working on at the moment, do you feel that reflecting on everything from the past, do you feel that you're still working on certain things? Absolutely, yes. I'm going back to my London days when I did a ceramics diploma at Central St. Martins. It was then Central School of Art and Design. And I have joined an evening class because at my age, I thought I'd like to, you know how your, your actions and your identity are sort of coded and commodified and stereotyped. And as a 72-year-old woman, I feel like what I'm expected to do is have lots of interests now <laughs> in my, you know, in my hobbies. retirement hobbies. <laughs> so I went back to do a ceramics evening class, which I'm really enjoying. I'm enjoying the skills, creating things that have a skill behind them, because a lot of the work I do is very conceptual, mm -hmm. and what I make is ephemeral often, you know, mm -hmm. it comes and goes, and it's not sustained. And where I've talked a lot about the fetishized, aestheticized art object. I'm quite enjoying my <laughs> pots, actually. I'm quite proud of them and wondering how I can put them into my practice as a fine artist because clay's become a very fashionable material within the fine art community. Because mm -hmm. as you probably know, there's always been this division between craft mm -hmm. and fine art, yes. the form of being seen as rather a subsidiary mm -hmm. of or not having the same status. I suppose that goes back to the idea that craft is a woman's mm -hmm. activity largely and, you know, women don't fit the fine art status category. That's an old thing, but it's still there. So merging art and design and craft has become quite acceptable within the area of fine arts. So that's another thing I'm doing. And I suppose largely I do work to commission or when people ask me to do things. And I, I'm sort of thinking it would be great just to make things down in my studio and then try putting them out there. And mm. It's quite scary, but it's almost like there's a sketchbook of ideas down there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've been doing is rescuing scraps of fabric from the beach, you know, mm -hmm. when they get washed in by the tide and caught up in seaweed. When I used to wander as a child along the shoreline collecting shells, now I collect bits of old <laughs> rotten old stinky old fabric. I think reparation is another aspect of my practice, collecting old, worn, forgotten, leftover bits and pieces and restoring them. And I've made quite a large quilt. I've obviously washed them mm. and they do smell for a while, but then that subsides. And now I'm making part flags, which aren't quite flags, but reference flags. And cushions, which aren't quite cushions, but reference bits of the body. Because some of those scraps of fabric, or in depth pieces of clothing, who knows where they exactly. come from. They might have very mundane, you know, somebody's dropped them on the beach, or they might have much more sinister mm -hmm. and 
poignant provenance. I've just been playing with this fabric and cutting it up and re-sewing it and trying out different things to do with it that are about putting all the fragments together, repairing, reusing. There's a sort of lovingness about it, you know, trying to recreate something positive out of something destructive. And there's lots more like that. <laughs> but yeah, those are sort of ongoing things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm trained as an art teacher and worked in higher education, training teachers in the arts. So I still maintain that. And I'm always fascinated by what children have to impart to me about mm -hmm. creativity, especially younger children who mm -hmm. haven't yet been told how to make art and their amazing perceptions of life mm -hmm. and what you do with it, really. I sometimes still get asked to do projects in schools, and I work with Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts with a learning team mm -hmm. as a freelance artist. And over the years, I've worked with such a range of people. It's fascinating, mm -hmm. from kids coming in from remand home to NHS workers to the over 50s, in inverted commas, mm -hmm. to little kids. And, of course, teaching on the MA there, doing summer schools. I love that wide range of connection because it sort of keeps you on your toes a bit. I'm just thinking about the idea of value. Yes. Because this is coming up quite a lot, is what has value in terms of maybe monetary worth or what has value in terms of is it legitimate, inverted commas? Does it have worth because it's a piece of work that could be held in high regard? Or how do you make those decisions? Who gets to choose? Even the idea of the ready-made fabrics, you know, and where they might come from. These may have been valued possessions of somebody at Absolutely, some point, And then yes. they become trash, mm, you know. Mm. And as you say, they could come loaded with, maybe haunted with, what could have happened to them in the past. And the journey that they've been, where in the world have they been? Where have they come from? What bits of the same garment are still out there? To not think of it as litter on a beach, but to reclaim it and mm -hmm. to make something new out of it is really fascinating. But also those other ideas about what's valued by the institutions, what's valued by academia, what's valued by other artists, what's valued in the domestic space. And there's so much about invisible labour and how valued that is as well because these are all things that are very important and they have to be done but they're not valued I don't really know where to go with that but it's just this is coming up so much in all of your work just this one word or value and the idea of worth as well all of the different ways we can explore that just through one person's body of work That's a really interesting and useful observation mm. Paula and something I shall think about in much more depth Yes, I mean, where do I begin on that one? And why do we value one thing over another as individuals? And where does that come from? I hope that, in general, the work is a critique of the system that we have, that places value on them. Art as a commodity, mm -hmm. people as commodities, and a system that's totally unfair in relation to equality of people's experience and their lives. Yeah, I think I'm questioning values right the way throughout and perhaps building a sense of where I place my own system of values. Mm -hmm. The work I make isn't largely saleable or collectible, but then a lot of art is now collected, whether it's a performance or a, mm -hmm. you know, conceptual. It seems to me that the system will appropriate mm -hmm or the institution will appropriate whatever, always find a way. So it's like dodging all the way, you know, if you are critical of all the systems that you come up against and are part of. And to a large extent, you are colluding in that. But nevertheless, asking those questions and constantly striving for some way of presenting your own perceptions to the world, whoever that is. For me, it's a very um, small corner of the world. I've got to have confidence in how I feel about those things. At the same time, as not being quite sure of what those values are. 
They shift, they change. But as you say, for me, value lies in the unseen. I've noticed in a lot of my work that repetition comes in, in a big, you know, behind the scenes. In order to make something, I have to use repetitive actions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. Whether yeah. it's, I mean, I've collected animal bones for years, and I, I'm just trying to sort those out mm -hmm. into vertebrae, ribs, mm -hmm. and various others. And I'm spending hours making piles mm -hmm. and then trying to reorder them into a system where I quite like them aesthetically as a sculpture and then they collapse and then that's good mm -hmm. and then I have to reorder them all again so mm -hmm. it's it's a fascinating process and it's it's a ridiculous process <laughs> and sometimes I feel quite embarrassed and hope that nobody comes in on me when I'm doing <laughs> these things because it's in many ways apparently a meaningless task. I suppose it's a bit like thinking back to childhood, it's like play. Absolutely, it's, like it's play. play. You build the Lego house, yes. you break it apart, Absolutely. you rebuild it a different Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's playful in the sense that you're exploring ways in which to operate in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. But it is akin to domestic labour and it is akin to stuff you do particularly as a woman, well, certainly within my history. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of the work I did with Carol was about. Unseen labour, absolutely. And the labour of workers who work on production lines who aren't valued in terms of the money they're paid for their labours or their humanity, they're rendered as subhuman. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, is far more important, perhaps, than the difficulties that women have you know, in terms of their roles, domestic roles, because that's shifting a bit, I have to say. But I don't think a capitalist system that exploits labour is... Mm -hmm. I think it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I speak as a middle-class, fairly privileged woman with mm -hmm. a fairly privileged background. But I suppose on another level, in another way, I feel that my age is now quite an issue because I'm not quite sure. <laughs> they talk about emerging, you know, if you, you have a call-out... And it's for emerging yeah. artists or young artists mm -hmm. or mid-career artists. I consider myself to be constantly in a state of emergence yes. Yes. and emergency <laughs> as an artist. But I just make it. It's a compulsion mm -hmm. and being creative. But I feel it could become self-indulgent if I didn't push it out there a bit and say, hey, folks, hey, gang, what do you think? Should we play together or mm -hmm. let's do something constructive? And I have to say the Shelter Project, which is where, of course, I met you, yes, right, yes. has shifted my perspective mm -hmm. on things. And I, I was recently approached by somebody who wanted to redo Shelter, which would be wonderful. So I'm considering that as okay. well. So it's not always nice to have projects in hand, mm -hmm. even if you're not putting anything out there. Mm -hmm. I find as I grow older, it takes much, much longer to process things and just generally make things and I think I've had a period when I've been quite thoughtful but not very active that's fine mm, those are important too those of course yeah. are important yes but again not always valued very much that's right because you if you're be. not seen to be working yes you're not working yes so. Huge thanks to Sally for being so generous with her time and ideas. For images of her work and more information, you can find her website at sallymadge.com and that's spelled S-A-L-L-Y-M-A-D-G-E. And there'll be links to events and the artists mentioned in the extended show notes I put together for members. For now, you've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair and Sally Madge. This episode was recorded and edited by Paula Blair and the music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 and downloaded from ccmixer.org. If you like the show, please support its production with donations to paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair or become a member on patreon.com forward slash AV Culture. From as little as $1 a month on the pay what you can tier, members receive access to exclusive previews, extended show notes and video transcripts. 
Episodes are released every other Wednesday. Please do rate, share and subscribe on your chosen platform as this helps others find the show. We're now on Spotify, so look out for us there if that's what you use. For more information and to see what any money received goes towards or how else you can be involved, visit audiovisualcultures, all one word, lowercase, dot wordpress, dot com. Follow AV Cultures on Facebook and Twitter for updates and links to items relevant to the discussions. Thanks so much for listening. Catch you next time.